Thank you very much. Yes, so I would like to talk about verifying strong eventual consistency in distributed systems. So it's verification, like in the last talk, but actually in a different setting. So the type of systems that we're talking about um, at first glance look similar. So we've got several nodes, each of which has some local data that is stored locally. Um, and then we can have users who come along and want to change some of the data on one of those nodes. And now whenever data is changed, we need to replicate that data to the other copies of the data on other nodes, so that all of the nodes have an up-to-date copy of the data. Now, where we start diverging from the consensus from the last talk is that we allow different users on different nodes to change the data concurrently. And so here maybe the purple user might come along and walk up to node J and make some change that is independent and concurrent to the change made by the red user. And this change then similarly needs to get replicated to the other copies, the other replicas of this data. Um, what we want is for these changes to be able to happen without synchronous coordination. And so there are a couple of examples of systems that actually do things this way. Uh, one is, for example, Google Docs. So you might have uh, used it before. It allows several people to concurrently, collaboratively edit the same document in a web browser. And the way it works is when you type a letter somewhere in the document to insert a letter, uh, that change is immediately applied to your local copy of the document, which lives in your web browser. And then it is asynchronously sent over the network to anyone else, any of your collaborators, who have a copy of this document open. And so um, what you get here is that you can actually have changes happening concurrently without knowledge of each other, and they need to be merged together. But it's not just collaborative editing end user applications. So actually, very similar uh, problems end up occurring in some geo-distributed uh, geo databases. So you may actually have state spread across multiple servers around the world. And so in that case, these nodes would be servers as opposed to like laptops and mobile phones. But actually, generally, the, the pattern of the data access and modification is very similar. And so what we want to support in these kind of systems is that users can still make changes to the data and read the data, even if they are temporarily disconnected from the rest. So if you have a network partition, which means that like, maybe there's some kind of network fault that means that the nodes temporarily can't talk to each other. Or maybe in the case of an end user device, it's simply like that they're out of Wi-Fi range and out of cellular data range. In that case, if it's a calendar app on your mobile phone, for example, you still want to be able to look at your local calendar and make changes to it. So in that case, we can't rely on synchronous coordination over the network uh, waiting for some messages to pass over the network in order to make some change, we have to allow each node to change data independently, even while it's offline. And so in that kind of system, an inevitable consequence is that the data on different nodes may diverge, because they might make changes without knowing about each other. Uh, and so strong eventual consistency is a consistency model that we can use to reason about the correctness of these kinds of systems. And so in a nutshell, what it requires is that, OK, it's fine for data to temporarily diverge, but we must be able to make it automatically converge again afterwards once the network partition is healed, so once the nodes are able to talk to each other. So let's have a concrete example. So I gave Google Docs as an example. So let's take that, a text document. So in this case, the red user and the purple user each have a copy of the same document that contains the text, hello. And the red user inserts the text oopsla before the exclamation mark. And so now it reads hello oopsla exclamation mark. And concurrently, the purple user inserts a smiley after the exclamation mark. And so these are two concurrent edits, but we can meaningfully merge them together. So a good way of resolving this, for example, would be to keep the oopsla before the exclamation mark and the smiley after the exclamation mark, and to just combine those two so that the end result is hello oopsla smiley. Um, so this is one example. Text editing is one way, uh, one type of data you can use here. Uh, but people have thought about other data types as well. So another might be a set. In a set, you can have concurrent modifications happening. Say the red user removes the element B from the set S. 
and concurrently the purple user adds the element C to the set S and again we can uh, merge these two, there's a sensible convergent outcome here which is to say that okay the B is removed, the C is added, the A is untouched so the end result is the set consisting of A and C. Uh, the third example uh, we can have counters, um, so a counter is just a natural number which you can increment or decrement and so you might have two users concurrently incrementing the counter starting from a starting state of one. And so what we want here is that both of those increments are preserved. We don't forget the fact that one of those, uh, that, that two increments happened. So a sensible merged outcome there is that the final counter value is three because it was incremented twice. So there are roughly speaking at a high level two families of algorithms that are used in order to achieve this kind of automatic merging and this convergence. Um, the first family is called operational transformation and that's been studied for a long time, so since the 80s already, and that is actually what uh, Google Docs is based on, so it uses one particular operational transformation algorithm. The algorithms that we've been looking at are a more recent uh, thing that has only come up within the last decade or so, they're called conflict-free replicated data types, or CRDTs for short. Um, so operational transformation has a bit of a long and complicated history, and lots of different algorithms have been proposed. All of these algorithms here on the slide are just for text editing, so they simply support the data type of an ordered list of characters in which users can insert characters and delete characters. That's all they deal with. But the reason why there are so many of them is that actually many of them were published and then later turned out to be wrong. And with wrong I mean here that like literally there are some situations in which these algorithms will permanently remain diverged. They fail to achieve even the most basic convergence property under certain circumstances. And so I mentioned this uh, just in order to make clear that you know, there's people say as a cliche distributed systems are hard. Like this is, all of these were published in reputable peer-reviewed venues and people only noticed like five to ten years later after these algorithms were published that they could find a simple counter example in which they were simply wrong. Some of these algorithms uh, turned out not to be wrong and so the one that's used in Google Docs which is called Jupyter um, is actually one of those that survived uh, but the reason it survived is that it constrains the network topology very heavily. So. In the case of uh, Google Docs, it requires that any change that is made flows through a central server which sequences all of those changes. And so this now means that even if, say, node I and node J are like my laptop and my mobile phone and they're 30 centimeters apart from each other and they would have local Bluetooth and local Wi-Fi to talk to each other, we cannot actually use that local network link because the operational transformation algorithm only works if everything is globally sequenced. So the nice thing about CRDTs is that we can support much more flexible network topologies. So you can imagine, for example, the blue user having two devices which just happily synchronize data between the two devices over some local network. The red user has two devices. And even if those two sets of devices are partitioned from each other, uh, you can still have the local synchronization happen uh, between each set. And then at some later point when internet connectivity is restored, then they will uh, finally merge their changes together. And so CRDTs allow us to support this kind of arbitrary network topology. So uh, given all of the problems that I mentioned with operational transformation in the past, we thought it would be very good to formally verify these algorithms uh, so that these very subtle mistakes that have um, occurred in previous algorithms we can hopefully avoid. Though even with CRDTs it's, it's not all straightforward, so uh, here's a lovely quote from uh, a paper on which Sebastian here was actually a co-author uh, last year. It uh, talks about RGA which is one particular CRDT which is actually one that we studied for text editing and says the reason this algorithm works has been a bit of a mystery. And so I feel that like algorithms are designed by humans for a purpose. There shouldn't really be much of a mystery around these things. So that is uh, why we work on formal verification to hopefully remove some of the mystery. So this is what we did. Uh, we used Isabel Hall, uh, interactive proof assistant, 
uh, to first of all just define exactly what it is we actually mean with strong eventual consistency. So uh, this was this definition was uh, provided semi-formally in, uh, in in a paper on CRDTs, uh, and we just formalized that into Isabel. And then we built up a framework for reasoning about CRDTs and showing that they satisfy these properties of strong eventual consistency. And uh, to make it concrete, we uh, proved the uh, the correctness of three particular CRDT algorithms, RGA, which is, as I said, a text editing algorithm, ORSET, which is a set and a counter, like I showed up earlier in the example. And so all of this is uh, based on a network model, which I shall explain in a moment. So some of the OT algorithms that went wrong in the past actually had proofs that accompanied them, but those proofs were wrong because the algorithm was wrong. And the way they went wrong was that they had assumptions in their undischarged assumptions that turned out to be false. So we knew that we had to be very careful with any assumptions that we make in the formalization of these algorithms. And so we found that when we were proving uh, the convergence, the correctness properties of, for, for example, RGA, uh, proving that it satisfies strong eventual consistency, that proof would work only under certain assumptions. So what we then included was a network model and showed that those assumptions that we have for the correctness are actually satisfied in all possible behaviors of the network model. So that allows us to discharge all of those assumptions and leave only the network model remaining. So the network model in turn is very simple. It's a, a standard abstraction that is used in, uh, in distributed systems, which is causal broadcast. We make no reliability assumptions. So we allow any messages to be lost in the network. We allow reordering and duplication of messages. So things can go arbitrarily wrong. And we show that under all of these possible network behaviors, the algorithm still behaves correctly because the correctness assumptions of the algorithms hold. So the network model is an axiomatic model that we set up with six axioms, but these are the only undischarged assumptions in the entire proof. So everything else is derived logically from, these, from this network model. So let me show you briefly what the formalization of strong eventual consistency looks like. So it consists of two safety properties. Uh, the first one is convergence, and the second one is progress. So convergence, we can prove uh, like this. This is a, a slight paraphrasing of what it actually looks like in Isabel. Uh, so we have a predicate called op history here. Uh, which simply says that XS and YS are valid operation histories. And so the op history is defined elsewhere in detail. And what we're saying here is that if XS and YS are both valid operation histories and they are permutations of each other, that is, they contain the same set of operations but potentially in some different order, then under that assumption, applying all of the operations in XS must result in the same final state as applying all of the operations in YS. So that's a, quite a straightforward way of expressing what we mean with convergence. And then progress is actually even simpler. That is just saying that we don't end up in an error state. So we allow this, uh, these operations, actually the, the return value is an option type, a maybe type. And so we represent a failure with none as a uh, as a final result. We're saying here, if XS is a valid operation history, then if you execute, if you apply those operations starting with a given initial state, then you don't end up in an error state. So these are the two safety properties that we require. Now, uh, sorry, my PowerPoint just crashed. This is unhelpful. So the last property I need to show you is um, just what it actually takes to prove one of these algorithms correct. So let me just quickly pull that up. Um, and that is that, um, so a lot of the proof framework handles uh, a lot of the uh, assumptions that, that are in there. So in particular, that what you need in order to prove the, um, uh, the valid operation history. But what remains then to be shown, what is specific to a particular CRDT algorithm, is this uh, property here, that concurrent operations commute. And so there's a bit of notation here, which I will unpack. So what this is saying is XS, again, is some 
sequence of operations. And so for any two operations, x and y, that appear in this uh, in the sequence of operations, if those two uh, operations are concurrent, then you must be able to apply them in either order and get the same outcome. So concurrent here is defined in terms of the happens before relation, which is uh, we can assume as the abstract simply being any partial order, and then our network model makes this happens before relation con uh, concrete. So if not x happened before y and not y happened before x, then that means the two operations did not know each about each other, so they are concurrent. And if that is the case, then require that the interpretation of x composed with the interpretation of y is the same, has the same effect as the interpretation of y composed with the interpretation of x. So it's written uh, here with this arrow composition because uh, this is monadic, so because the uh, interpretation of operation is allowed to fail, so in this case uh, it composes them in the case where they succeed. So that's kind of the uh, broad overview for all the details. The proof document is online, um, and of course uh, the Isabel files are online, and it would be wonderful if anyone wants to play with it, further extend it, and add more data types to it. Thank you very much.